Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Free Will, Science, and Religion. We have a group call. We've been talking for the last hour and a half or so. On the line we have Jamie, Chandler, Felicia, David, Will, and me, George. So we've been talking about like, you know, the religious implications of free will and like if somebody has a free will, where, when do they get it and all? Okay guys, where were we? Uh, we were talking about the um, age of responsibility in the criminal justice system, and I was agreeing with Felicia uh, Hogan's points about, you know, 18 or over, you you have more experience, like, um, as far as, like, you know, life goes. But the, fi the point remains, um, during your adulthood, you have as much free will as you did when you were a kid, which is zero. You, you can only be what na um, nature compelled you to be. That makes sense. That makes yeah. sense. Well, the way I see it is like uh, we're like computers. Depending depending upon what you're programmed to do, you're gonna do just that. What you're programmed to do. <laughs> yeah, bad brains give out bad results. It's the same thing with yeah. like, you know, computers. I mean you don't you don't um, blame the computer and say, Oh, this PC is going to hell for, you know, giving out errors and stuff, you know what I mean? So, I mean, <laughs> so if someone's an idiot, yep. you know, you just forgive them for it, don't you? Yeah, you know I mean? Exactly. What do you guys think is yeah. the, the, the greatest barrier to people getting this? What do you think is, like, put it getting in the way of their getting this? Well, I think it's mostly, um, I think people are afraid of the consequences because there are people out there spreading the myth that if people realize they don't have a free will, then they're all going to turn into rapists and serial killers. And I don't see how that works because I didn't turn into a rapist and serial killer. So why would hey, I believe that others would? Not yet. <laughs> Not only that, but people also fear what that would do to the, the justice system. When I first heard this idea that we don't really have a free will, but it's nature and nurture, it was in high school, like, eighth or ninth grade really and I said that's absurd how can you say that that's humanist if that were true then we couldn't have uh, how would we keep people accountable in society it would be chaos Excellent. and now so, many years later I, I understand how that works so explain that explain to the audience how we would still keep our rules and laws even everyone understanding that the free will is completely impossible hmm. Is completely you possible? Or no, that impossible. Completely impossible. impossible. Okay. It's not um, impossible. It's just, I think that would be kind of hard to get adjusted to. Well, uh, all right. Go ahead, Felicia. Oh, um, I was saying that there's a difference between consequences for your actions and a fundamental responsibility. And what would happen if we were to realize that free will is an illusion that we don't have free will and we're the product of our upbringing and our biology is that our criminal justice system would have to entirely change. It couldn't be about punishment for that which we have no control over. It would have to be about a learning process and rehabilitation. But we still need reward and punishment in the sense that we need to deter bad behaviors. We need to, re we need to incentivize, you know, things like work ethic and, um, you know, steer people away from things like shoplifting, things of that nature, you know what I mean? Because we can't have yeah. people going around doing these things. It costs I mean, you, money. You, it would essentially, I mean, you'd be sent to a rehabilitation program. You wouldn't have a choice in the matter. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, is that we still need to, you know, keep certain things in place to steer people in the right direction. You know what I mean? So I think I'm saying civil, basically. Yeah, under the free will belief, like we we want to punish people sometimes a lot more than they than it's required for them to learn from their mistake. You know, it's about vengeance, retribution. It's about seeing them as evil. So, like, yeah, we still have our rules and laws and all, but I think we'd be much more compassionate toward people who were through no will of their own. You know, the universe um, made break those rules and laws. Yeah, and the media seems to like to. You know, um, it seems like some great criminals and the most people to schemes. Well, well, mute your mic, dude. We're hearing a lot of background noise. My bad. Right, carry on. 
All right, actually, Will brought up a, an, an interesting question. He's, you know, like, basically, in, in a lot of the shows that I've done, I basically say that the, 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 the concept of free will, the notion of free will is impossible. Is, is it in any way possible that we could have a free will? Well, here's the interesting thing. The only way to have a free will is to redefine free will in the way that compatibilists do. That's the only way that anybody's ever even tried. And then you have to think, okay, well, what is that will free from? And then if you define it as you have free will if no one's holding a gun to your head, well, sure, then, we all, then anyone who doesn't have a gun held to their head has free will. But I think it still misses the entire point. <laughs> all right, so it's – like uh, confession with or without coercion. Um, explain that. Like, if you confess to a crime, just you know because you feel guilty, then that confession stands in court that you confess of your own volition. Essentially, it's a lower standard of free will. Versus if you were in say Guantanamo Bay, if you confess there, it doesn't stand in court in any real you know, legal court, because that's confession under duress. Okay, so in a certain sense, like, so they may try to redefine free will to say, like, like you know, we have free will because, you know, because nobody was coercing us. You know, in other words, like, it doesn't matter if our genes and our environment and all, or especially our genes, are influencing our behavior. Just because nobody was actually making us think and, and feel what we do and, and say what we do, we have free will. But, like, isn't that impossible? I mean, isn't, in other words, this, this law of cause and effect, because everything that we do, you know, the, any, every, every decision we make, everything we do, the causal antecedents to it regressed back to before we were born. So isn't it true that there's no conception, no definition of free will that can possibly be true? I agree no. because nobody is free from the coercion by other living uh, things, whether human or other animals. We are not free from those other things that coerce us into doing what we do. And if you are made to feel ashamed and guilty for something – um, because your parents brought you up that way, well, that's still stuck with you even after your parents are dead. So you are still being coerced by your dead parents if they if they forced you to believe a certain way. And that's important to understand is that we're never free from coercion. So even that definition can't work. I don't know if coercion is really the right word to use there. Maybe more like affected by. Yeah. Interesting, because yeah, sure there's a difference. Well, the human brain's still obeying evolution. Isn't it? I mean, evolution still applies to consciousness and stuff like that. I mean, it's a it's a main um, law of entropy, isn't it? Yeah, sometimes sometimes free will believers will say, well, you know, like our genetics don't don't really compel or coerce our behavior. They simply only influence our behavior. But I mean, like a good analogy to explain how that's not the case. For example, let's say like you're given an assignment in school to do a report, right? And let's say one of your parents does about a quarter of your report, you know, for you, and like you're handing it in. Can you truly say that it is your report? You know, so like in that same way that you would be like dishonest, it would be like plagiarism, whatever it is, like to claim that your your work is yours if one quarter of it wasn't it. Isn't it the same that like we can't uh, claim we have a free will if if we have this this unconscious that's constantly, you know. Working, we're not even know it's there. No, in other words, uh, like the unconscious or genetics don't have to be completely determining our behavior to negate, you know, our our free will. So what you're saying, um, like someone who sits a, a maths exam, right? Are you saying that their subconscious is doing the, um, you know, calculations for them? Well, yeah. In other words, like our unconscious. Think about it. Our unconscious is. Uh, Awake all the time. We go to sleep and our conscious mind, you know, goes to sleep, whatever. But our unconscious is operating 24-7. And, and think about it. Our unconscious is where all our memories are stored, where all our thoughts, you know, our words are stored. And it's also like if, if we're unconscious of this place where all our memories are, um, yeah. whenever we make a decision, 
then then the processing of that decision has to be made by the unconscious because that's where all the the principles for deciding are and that's where all the memories by which we decide must be so so in actuality what what happens is like we don't actually make any conscious decisions at all our unconscious makes these decisions and then we become aware or conscious of what our unconscious has decided yeah I understand um, thoughts are not up to us because um, when we go to sleep, sometimes we dream or have nightmares. I mean, who would choose to have nightmares? I mean, if, if you were like getting chased by someone who, um, who was about to stab you um, in a nightmare, right? Obviously, you've got to run away. You're not going to, you know, stand there and let it happen to you. Um, regard, I mean, in your nightmares. Unless you're a right? pacifist. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in your nightmares, you get the impression that it's real, didn't you? Sometimes it's real to you, and that's why it's so scary. No. Yeah, I think it needs to be pointed out. Well, I'll, have to, that the, I'll have to talk to y'all later because I'm about to head on the ground. All right, good, good talking to you, Will. All right, thanks, Will. I will. All right, you stay safe. Yep, you too. You too. Yeah. yeah. I think it, it needs to be pointed out that aside from the fact that we don't get to choose our, our genetics, you know, our DNA and all that, and we don't get to choose all the things that we're taught all, the whole time growing up and all the different things we experience every day that whether you say it coerces or it influences, even though I don't think there's much of a difference between those two, you know, and aside from the whole unconscious thing, which is true – but there's another thing to point out, you know, like Felicia mentioned, she doesn't change the chemical levels in her brain, the serotonin and dopamine. She doesn't she can't just do some action to, to, to make that go up or down. And so we still don't have the type of control over our emotions and how we feel about things to be responsible in the way that that people typically think you are responsible. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, and when we go to sleep at night, um, when our um, when we go to rapid eye movement, that's what it's called REM sleep, right? That's when we're dreaming. We don't choose um, what our dreams are, which are based on you know what we remember. Now, you sh that's what our dreams are based on, isn't it, George? They're based on what, what uh, our stored memories. Yeah. Absolutely, David. David, what do you think is the strongest refutation? There's various ways to refute free will. What do you think is the strongest refutation among them? Um, what about the uh, the experiments done by uh, was it Benjamin LeBay? Okay, do you want to describe but, them? Um, I think it was an experiment done where they could predict what the uh, person in the study was going to choose about six seconds or seven seconds before they actually yeah, the readiness chose it. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I that's, think that's a good indication. Absolutely. If, if a researcher, if an experimenter can know what you're going to decide before you know it, you know, and I think like most recent replications have it up to almost 10 seconds. I mean, like, how can right. you possibly, you know, believe that the decision is yours? Exactly. I mean, I think um, Sam Harris makes it quite clear as well when he says you can't think what you think before you think it. You know, it's very difficult to do. That's what <laughs> Susan Blackmore said as well, wasn't it? Yeah. I believe so, yeah. 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 And think about like uh, this talk right now. I mean, like before we 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 say what we're going to say, we have we don't really have an idea. We at, 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 we have maybe a, a notion of what we want to say, but we have to say it to kind of like to then realize what it is we're saying. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and there's another thing here too. I can't control what you guys are saying, and everything you say causes me to react and think and say what I say. So. There's an interconnectedness and a relevance among all of us cause and effect that no none of us can claim responsibility for of what's happening on this podcast. Excellent point. Because we don't live in a vacuum. Oh yeah. Let's let's explore why the, the belief in free will is harmful. What are some of the things that like free will belief that does that, that just makes life more difficult for us? Well, it's in, in terms of like you know uh, gay rights or you know people who are transgender and stuff, um, especially re when it comes to religion, people hold them accountable um, in a deep sense and say, look, you're doing something evil, you're going to hell. I'm, I'm just saying what religious bigots will say to you know gays and transgenders. They'll say look, um, you shouldn't be um, going out with the same sex or whatever, you know, because it's sinful and uh, it's uh, what is it, Dave? Help me out here. <laughs> uh, yeah, sinful. Sinful is a good yeah. word. 
Uh, an abomination is the word they use usually. Exactly. That's better. That's better. Yeah. And so you're saying free will belief encourages people to hate other people. Exactly. Yeah. It Definitely. encourages them to, you know, be bigoted. The bigoted is the word. I think it's part of the uh, part of the blame game. I think it's called. Mhm. Mm yeah, but that's that's what breeds bigots. The uh, fundamental blame. Yeah, absolutely. I think something else, um, for example, we don't just blame other people, we blame ourselves. We do something wrong, and like, you know, I think very early in life, when we're toddlers, maybe before that, we're taught, well, if we do something wrong, then we need to be punished, because if we're not punished, we're not going to learn better. And so, like, we, we keep that understanding as adults, so whenever we do something wrong, yeah, I think like reward and punishment helps condition us to do the right thing, but this free will belief makes us go beyond that. It makes us like say, well, it's not just about punishment, it's like that we deserve to be punished because we did this wrong, because like, you know, because it, it's fundamentally up to us, so I think basically it, it, it encourages us, it motivates us to punish ourselves, to feel guilty and the pain of guilt much more than we would if we just realize. In other words, like to the extent we, we overcome the belief in free will, we might say to ourselves, well, oh, you know, I did something wrong. I'm acknowledging that it's wrong and now I'm vowing not to do it again. But we don't have to go through all the self-punishment to reach that. It's a much more compassionate, self-compassionate attitude. One of the interesting things or another example of how when we're kids and we're taught about the idea of responsibility and that you did something bad, you know, that's your fault is uh, just another example where, you know, my family has depression, anxiety that just runs genetically. And when I was a kid, like 10 at the latest, my mom and my sister told me it was my fault that my younger sister went to counseling and what yes and so recently in the past year i went to counseling myself for some of the problems with my family and leaving my religion and that sort of thing and i realized that i feel responsible for other people's happiness and when somebody else isn't happy i feel bad i feel like it's my fault and that's where that stems from and it, it's affected everything I do in my relationships. Yeah. Exactly. Go ahead, Chandler. Yeah, that's my point exactly. Just one thing that someone said to you as a child or even as an adult can affect your thoughts and affect you so much leading to depression. Or, of course, it can work the result the reverse way. Something can make you happy if it's a good experience too. But that just goes to show you that what you're doing now is not free from everything that happened in the past. All right, now here's an interesting point. So Felicia, I'd like in therapy, like I think they teach people to not blame themselves because like we're not responsible for our emotions, we're not responsible for our problems, right? I think that's the approach that they have in, in psychotherapy in general. And like in psychology, you know, I think the basic understanding is that human behavior is the result of nature and nurture, you know, a combination, either or whatever. So, like, according to that understanding, there's no room for free will there. So then you have to ask yourself, why doesn't psychology, why doesn't, you know, the medical profession establish the, and, and, and promote the understanding that we don't have free will? You well... Know, I'm kind of surprised they haven't yet considering all the studies they've done on the brain and on the brain of people with mental disorders like anxiety depression bipolar psychopathy is that you can actually see differences in the brain development for the people well, who have think, disorders. exactly yeah well, and well i think part of the reason they haven't uh, admitted this to themselves what what this means for free will is because they're part of religions who believe this free will thing and it's so essential that they don't that they miss the contradictions of the psychology and science that they they know because it contradicts with other beliefs that they have to keep they think do you think it's a it's a question of their not understanding intellectually that free will is impossible because of nature and nurture or do you think it's a, a lack of moral integrity that they get it but but they refuse to acknowledge it because it doesn't fit in with what they want to believe I yeah. think it's both. I think it's neither. 
All right, Felicia, that's a good. So, like, go ahead. That's interesting. <laughs> oh well, I'm gonna let Chandler go first with the the both, and then I'll cool. go with the negative. Sounds good. Okay. Yeah. First of all, I think many people don't intellectually get it because they don't really understand cause and effect, and that everything has a cause. Plus, they may not be aware of the unconscious and how that works because they think all thoughts are conscious thoughts or something. But at the same time, there are there will be people who they know that it, free will is impossible, but they will argue that people should still believe it because they're afraid of adverse consequences or because free will is part of their Christianity or Islam or whatever religion they're part of. It's essential teaching, and they can't give it up because then there's bad consequences for that, and that means they have to change it. They don't want to. So there's a sort of dishonesty going on there. Like they know better, but – but for reasons they have, they um, they still don't want people to be aware of it, so they try to keep it hidden. Okay, good. So what what are, what might be some of those reasons? Well, for one thing, I believe that they are afraid of the breakdown of morality because they think that you have to believe that you are re fundamentally responsible, otherwise you will just start doing crimes and I'm not sure how that works because there's a lot of free will believers who are still criminals <laughs> um, but there, but there's also it is it seems like it's so tied in with our the psychological need people have to take credit for the good because they take credit for the good things that happen but then they never take the blame they're always blaming somebody else and so they're they are flip-flopping and, and even yeah, it doesn't really make any sense whether you believe in free will or not. That kind of hypocrisy is still stupid, but it's, it's so weird. They are addicted to blaming. They are addicted to crediting themselves, and because of their need to feel morally superior to other people because they made better choices and think they'll be rewarded in an afterlife or, uh, or in this life, I think they need that so badly – that right. they they just cannot accept it. Excellent explanation, Chandler. Now, Felicia, you have a different take. Why do you think it's so uh, difficult for people to understand that free will is completely impossible? Well, I think the original question is why the scientific community, the mental health professional community, doesn't accept this or promote the idea that there's no free will, either because they don't understand or out of malicious intent, that they're deliberately being dishonest about it. I think that was the original. Yeah, I'm sorry. You're completely right. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and I, I would say that I think it's neither. I think it's extremely rare that people do what they, what they realize is wrong, that there is a justification for. I think everyone tries to do the best that they can. Even, you know, I'll even go so, so far as say as even Hitler was doing what he thought was right. It's extremely yes. rare that people do what they know is wrong. All right, so, so I don't think that it's fair to to think that the entire mental health professional community would be deliberately trying to hide this from the public. I think that that's a conspiracy theory that I could not support. All right, so you're right. Let's let's say we, let's say it's not like malicious, but but then how do we explain it? What how do I, how, you know? How do we explain? For us, it's it's relatively clear. That, that free will, you know, that we don't have a free will. How? Why is it not as clear to them? I don't know that's necessarily not as clear to them, to be perfectly honest, as the, the mental health community as a whole. I mean, we see tons of articles and studies on this sort of thing that, you know, some of us here have, have read, or at least read about, that has led us to make the change in our philosophy. But the thing is, though, that these people are not philosophers. It's not necessarily their job to interpret this information as far as how it, people should be applying it to their everyday philosophy of life. That's, you know, the job of philosophers. And honestly, how many Americans read scientific studies? How many? <laughs> okay. I mean, come on. So, All right. I don't think that community, it's the rest of us, the rest of the people who aren't reading this stuff. All right, David, we just heard, like, the USA take on why the medical establishment doesn't get this or, like, doesn't promote it all. What, how, what is the UK – what do you think you know, it is like in the UK with the, with the medical establishment there? David? Um, I, I would say this um, quite apathetic towards the idea, really. They just don't care as far as, as far as I can see. And the ones that do care, 
uh, tend to just play the blame game. Okay. Uh, we got media, media over here, it basically criminalizes being poor. And so at the moment, if you're poor, if you're fat, if you're taking any kind of a, a benefit system from the government, then people have been influenced to blame those people. So they don't consider why those people have been put into that situation. All they do is say, you have free will, you could have done otherwise. And so that's it, you're responsible. All right, so in a certain sense, they're kind of defending the status quo, just defending the way we do things. Exactly, yeah, exactly that. Okay, Jamie, what's your take? I, Jamie may not be there. All right, you you raised a, an interesting question, an interesting topic, the idea that, that they don't understand, um, they may not understand the relevance of this. It's that they're apathetic because maybe they don't get how much it matters. I just want to, we've got about five minutes left. Um, I want to present this, this idea how the medical establishment should really um, take a huge interest in this because of what we're familiar with as climate change denial. We know that like here in the United States about 66% of Americans deny that climate change is happening and deny that human beings are cause, causing it. All right, now, like, denial, as everybody knows, is a psychological s defense mechanism that people use when they feel indicted. When, people, uh, when scientists are telling people, you know, you're doing something so horrible that, that billions of people could die in the future and civilization could collapse because of what you're doing, you know, people are, who believe in free will are saying, oh, my God, you know, like, we, we can't be that horrible. In other words, people cannot accept that they could be doing something, that their friends could be doing something so horrible, so they're unconscious, can't accept it and goes into denial. So like, to a certain extent, it's this denial that's preventing people from looking at the evidence about climate change objectively and finally, you know, being able to accept that it's happening so we can finally do something about it. What do you guys think? So the idea is like, if, yeah. if, if, if people, if scientists would tell people, listen, yes, we are like wreaking havoc on the climate in, in various ways. We need to change. We need to change quickly. But don't feel guilty about this because like it's not your fault. You don't have a free will. You know, humanity was compelled to do what we did. So like, in other words, if we could lift the guilt and lift the blame from people, maybe they can, would be able to accept what's happening more. I, I think I you're think right, George. I, I think if the scientists were to say that, you know, it's not your fault, you don't have a free will, that would be dangerous to their health here in the U.S. Um, I would definitely not recommend they try to tell the Christian public that <laughs> right off the bat. Because, <laughs> Felicia, you're afraid that, like, people will say, well, if it's not my fault, then I'm not going to do anything about it. Or Some people, especially people who are just being exposed to this idea, especially on the Christian side, when your entire life your entire worldview is on Christianity alone. Without that, everything falls apart. That absolutely there's uh, a misunderstanding, I think, of, of what free will is and how that affects our society. I think that the whole place will be in chaos. Okay, all right. And also, isn't it kind of like a fundamentalist Christian belief that climate change is actually God's will? It's part of like the apocalypse, and like they kind of like are welcoming it. <laughs> That's right. I've I've seen that. You know, I've I, heard that. Like, <laughs> I've I've heard I've heard that from some people, but honestly, I think the fundamentalist Christian community doesn't think it's happening, at least not the community I grew up in. I heard from you know national speakers who told me that there was no scientific evidence for global warming. Well, thank goodness. Thank goodness for that. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, all right, we've got about uh, three minutes left. Okay, um, Jamie, are you on the line? Yes, I'm still here. All right, so Jamie, again, we had a question before, like, why do you think the, the medical establishment in the UK, who should get the free will's illusion, why do you think they either don't pay attention or they don't get this? Why aren't they promoting to the world, you know, they're like, we can overcome our guilt and our blame by overcoming free will belief? Well, one, one reason, I guess, is because it, sell pa it sells papers, or maybe um, the conservative government, especially as far as, like, um, um, you know, well, the Conservative Party are concerned. They like to promote um, the idea of um, personal responsibility, don't they, David? That's very true, yeah. Yeah. 
Excellent. All right, we've got about 30 seconds left. Okay, thank you, Jamie, Chandler, Felicia, and David. You know, this is like the Free Will Science and Religion podcast. Our, our goal is to have a podcast published uh, once a day. We've got about like 11 or 12 co-hosts. We want to up that number to like at least 14. So again, we'll be back next time with another edition of Free Will Science and Religion. Again, look look for us on YouTube. Eventually, when we premiere in, all, in April, we're going to be on iTunes also. Okay, thanks for listening, everybody.